country and here we go with the Azores carrying on a little bit for today with Portugal like Portugal yesterday with the first like proper overseas territory that kind of technically can possibly constitute a separate country in itself kind of thing so yeah here we go with the Azores archipelago as the Azores have a call kind of like past dating back to its discovery in the 15th century and throughout its history it's experienced like prosperity, piracy and revolution and these days it's known for an easygoing atmosphere and spectacular scenery that attracts tourists for today so yeah the archipelago was believed to have been discovered in around 1427 by Portuguese navigator Dior de Silves, who initially landed on the Azores islands of Santa Maria and São Miguel. Five years later, another explorer called Goncalo Velo Cabral disembarked on Santa Maria with 12 crew members, and however, it was not until 1439 that settlers apparently from the Algarve region of Portugal began to inhabit the islands. And over the next decade the largest island, Sao Miguel, attracted Portuguese French and French families who recognised the fertility of the Atlantic Islands of in the production of wheat cane, sugar cane, and oranges led by positive economic growth in the Azores, as well as fueling the expansion and population and forced la labour force. And by the turn of the 17th century, Sao Miguel had become a major hotspot for the battling European pirates before it eventually fell to the hands of the Spanish troops. However, it returned to Portuguese rule in 1640, and by that point, Ponta de Garda had been named the capital of the Azores, and the economic hub due to its strategic, strategic, strategic location on the coast. Terra Sierra, the third island to be colonised, became a source of great pride for like, Portuguese. Portuguese in the 16th century were covering like, the last of the country's territory to fall to the Spanish king Philip II in 1583 after defending the island for two years the Portuguese were conquered by the king's forces which moved to occupy the Azores and during the decades of Spanish control, the locals stayed loyal to the Portuguese monarchy. And following the restoration of the Portuguese crown, the islands went through a slow period of development and continued to function as a significant agriculture and economic hub. After the outbreak of the Portuguese Civil War in 1820, Terra Sierra became the main headquarters for the new Portuguese regime led by Maria I with Angra named the new constitutional capital of Portugal in opposed to the absolutist forces forces. In the absolutist after the outbreak of the Portuguese Civil War in eighteen twenty, Terra Sierra became the main headquarters of a new Portuguese regime led by Maria I, with Angra named a new constitutional capital, capital of Portugal, and in opposition to the absolutist forces in Lisbon. And during World War II, the Portuguese dictator António de Oliveira Salazar leased a navy base throughout the Azores to Nazi Germany. But later switched the policy, allowing the British to locate to the archipelago, altering the fortunes of the Allied forces for a significant time during the Battle of the Atlantic. And a year later, the American Navy constructed a base on Santa Maria, but it was later relocated to its current home on Terra Sierra. Uh, the Jess Field. Early years of volcanic archipelagos, cultures crafted Portuguese 
from the Portuguese traditions and has, has its own regional identity and religion remains a part at the heart of these old islands culture and with festivals and celebrations dominating the calendar in addition to retaining traditional cooking techniques and celebration from the whaling and agricultural past as the Azorians celebrate their individual style of cuisine, magic and politic, music and politics which can be seen as magic and I swear I'm just going to briefly say that the Azores speak Portuguese which and speak something similar to the modern standard Portuguese spoken on mainland Portugal. Uh, but for now I'm going to be talking about a little bit about something else as I found an article on genetics. As the Azor Island islands were uninhabited when discovered by Portuguese navigators in the 15th century and are located about 1,500 kilometers from the European mainland. And the archipelago was formed by nine volcanic origin of volcanic origins that define three geographical groups. It is the eastern, central, and western. It is Esme. So I'm again. Uh, Madrada, Maria. Yeah. Then the central is Tayasuri, Fenar, Pico, Graciosa, and San Jorge. And western is Flores and Corvo. And it's a bit like there's a study on like MT. DNA was conducted in the population on the archipelago when the HVRI region was subsequently in sequence and specific R FLPs were screened in like about somewhere around 146 samples from like unrelated people in the Azor of Ori's Azorian ancestry. 50 from the eastern group, 60 from the central group, and 37 from the western group. And the samples were classified into haplogroupers based on the information obtained from the sequencing of and the RFLP analysis. And the analyse performs for the idea that the whole group of islands the majority of the mtdna uh, languages originate from the iberian peninsula like spain and portugal but mainly from like the port like portuguese mainland but contributions from other european populations especially from northern europe can't be like disregarded as it is still significant as an analysis of genetic data by groups of islands show that the western group exhibited more partic like particular features and the distribution of the haplo groups in the western is very atypical being significantly different from what is observed in the eastern central groups and the diversity values are like in the general like lower than those observed in other populations uses comparisons as African haplo groups were found in all groups of islands and the presence of Moorish and African slaves on the islands are reported in historical sources and is supported by the mtDNA genetics data especially in like the more eastern groups and the presence of like a Jewish population in central group is also spotted by the mtDNA data and neither historical nor genetic data. No phylogeography or mtDNA supports the idea of the different settlement his differential settlement history for the Western groups whole is represented in the phylogenies 
as in an isolated branch, the effects of drift genetic drift induced by the reduced population size since people occurred has led to a very atypical distribution of the uh, haplogroups or he haplotypes in this group of islands. And yeah. And some people kind of ignore the influence of biodemographic and genetic processes, namely found effects, genetic drift, migration, even recent mutual events in mtDNA lineages of the Azores pop populations and great parts of vari variation in the Azorean mtDNA can be explained in like the settlement history, which I kind of briefly did talk about in the history just before. So yeah, moving on to the tradition, last traditional part of the video, which is legends, and there's still a few, like a few in the Azores that I can talk about now. As there's the Azorean legends of the origins of the lagoon of the seven cities, and the island which starts there is on the island of Sao Miguel, in the archipelago, in the archipelago of the Azores, there are two lakes known as Lagoon of the seven cities or Lagoa, da Seta, Cid Hades in Portuguese and a important source of like fresh water and largest body of water on the islands and the two lakes are situated by the crater of a dormant volcano and are connected to e well, our channels. Thank you. The lakes are situated in the crater of a dormant volcano. Are connected to each other by a narrow channel that today has a bridge over. Bridge over it, and despite the connection, the twin lakes are ecologically different and a natural feature of the island landscape. Thus, has evolved a number of myths and legends to explain their origins. And then there's Princess and Tilla, Tilia. Local legend tells that there was once a bad tempered king whose wife had died and left and had been left to bring up his daughter named Antilia alone and the king had great he loved her mother and he doted upon his daughter. When his wife had died he had almost exclusive exclusively taken on care and upbringing on his daughter aided only by an elderly nurse. And he loved his daughter dearly and she was the source of all his pleasure and pride and joy of his life. As she wanted to keep her as he wanted to keep her all for himself and kept her separate from the other other children and people and he will, and he would not let her speak or play with anyone else but him and all the nurse he was looking after. Her. And who thought it was a shame she could not mix and play with children her own age. But regardless, the years pass by, and as the years will do, and the young princess grew into a beautiful young woman. And as a young woman, and Tilia attracted the attention of many handsome young men, as beautiful young women do. Her father was jealous of the interest towards her daughter and seeking to keep her solely for himself and banned her entirely from leaving the limits of the castle and grounds. And Tilia was disappointed and with a ban and because she was not at an age when she wanted to be as was exploring about wanted to be ex no, exploring the world and making friends with young men and women of her own age. Every day after his dinner at midday, the king would fall asleep and sp spend the rest of the afternoon snoring until the evening came, and it was time for tea. Every now and then, with the help of the old nurse, Antilia would escape the confines of the castle and its grounds, and go and explore the towns and villages from the castle. And she loved these times of escape, and each one seemed to be an exciting, exciting adventure to her. So yeah, then there's a shepherd on the hill, 
which brings an Ed <laughs> Sheeran song into my head. Over the castle on the hill. Oh, pants. One day, she, no, it's funny. One day while she was venturing along out along the country lane, she heard most wonderful music and followed the sounds of sea was making it. With the aforementioned princess. And on a small hill she discovered a young shepherd about her own age sat playing a flute. That's what seemed to stir the music or perhaps because she was just a tiny bit shy of a housing young man she hid behind a bush to listen to play with him. And for many weeks after Antilia would continue to sneak out of the castle but she always made her way to hill to hear the young man play his flute again. And she would always hide in the bushes to listen enchanted to the wonderful music he made and all that. One day he caught her as she hid behind a bush and she feared he would be angry. Instead the young man had fallen head over heels in love with her. At first dying, sight and he told her so and he became friends and lovers. From then on whenever Antilia escaped from the castle she made her way to the hill where the shepherd was waiting for her. Then he would play his flute and they would laugh and chat happily together. And in a happy place they blossomed in the company of each other and one day the shepherd proposed marriage and she readily agreed. And the next day with the help of her old nurse until he escaped the castle in early in the morning and met up with her lover. Together they went to, and the, to the castle door and knocked loudly upon it and a servant answered. When he saw who was there quickly went to fe fetch the king and the king came to the door see what was going on and found his beloved daughter stood blushing on her hands with a young man. And as the king glowered at him, at the young man, summoned him up the courage nervously but politely asked for his daughter's hand in marriage. And the face of a glowing king turned red and then purple with rage, pulling his daughter indoors and angrily ordering the young man off the grounds while slamming the door. And once inside, he berated Antilia and strictly forbade her from ever talking or see or talk to him again. Requesting like retribution if she like terrible retribution if she if she disobeyed. And heartbroken, Antilia sobbed all through the rest of the day and all through the night. And last morning, the old nurse went to her and Antilia begged her to help her see her lover one last time. And scarily went to the king and begged that Antilia may have one last meeting with her love to say goodbye. <laughs> no idea what can be doing. And after much begging and pleading, the king reluctantly agreed. They're all walking down there.
You okay, Dalma? Okay. <laughs> now, moving on to the final part of the story, we on the river of tears. Heartbroken couple met for the last time on the hill where she found him playing his flute, and he sat down together and cried two rivers of bitter tears. And the rivers flowed down the hill and formed two beautiful lakes which reached out and connected with each other. The tears from the eyes of green eyes of Princess Antilia from the green lake and the tears from the blue eyes of the lover from the blue lake. From the blue lake. And the two lakes were united by a narrow tra channel of water. Where they are known today as the lagoon of seven cities or the Goa, Dasate Cidades, and although the two lovers could not be together on earth, their tears remained together so they would not forget them. So, yeah. <laughs> no, maybe too, too long. So, yeah, I'm gonna say bye for now and I'll see you all later. <laughs>